some of the stuff that the Lord's been giving me is, is a little deeper. And he gave me some, some amazing revelation. And sometimes he humbles me by giving me some of my revelation talking to my wife. But because well, she's just like more intelligent than I am. But um, made such an amazing discovery yesterday. The, the, the presence of God was just tremendous. And, and so a lot of this stuff that I'll tell you sounds new. Um, and if you don't like get it, don't despise it because, you know, things have to mature before you can really begin to see what God's trying to tell you. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm like going into all this kind of gently only for the fact that um, a lot of it is new territory. It's not like I'm following the teachings of anyone or I'm just following the lead of the Holy Spirit and I give it to you as he gives it to me. And so uh, <clears throat> some of it I'm just giving in small tiny bites because if I gave it to you all at once, you'd leave and never come back. Oh, <laughs> I don't think this is going to be very long. I'd probably have you out by, I don't know, supper time. This is called Div Divine Arrangement Alone. Lord, give us understanding. Matthew 25. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called, who? His own servants and delivered to them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his personal or his several ability. And straightway he took his journey. This is, of course, talking about Jesus. And Jesus said that he has called his own. Remember, we read that. He called his own servants. And the word his own is a Greek word, ideos, and it means his private, his separate. His ones who have been separated unto himself. His private servants. Ones who have been separated unto himself. How many understand this is divine ownership? When you're called as a servant of God, how many know if you're a servant, Paul called himself a slave. A slave of Jesus Christ. A slave unto the gospel of Christ. How many know that you're owned by someone else? When you're a servant, you're owned by someone. We need to recall in Matthew chapter 22, where Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen. How many ever noticed that Jesus never said that all are called? I just want you to see this. These are just facts in Scripture, truth that I want to show you. But he never said that all are called. Why? Because all who are called or chosen have been separated unto God. They are ideos, his own personally selected servants. How many of you know God has a right to personally select anyone he wants to do whatever he wants them to do? How many believe that's true? How many know he's God? How many know we just got done singing, you are God alone? <laughs> and God has a personality. You realize that, right? God has a personality. And he chooses however he wants. He has a will. And by his own will, he chooses. <clears throat> We're called or chosen. Those are separated unto God or ideos, his own personally selected servants. Remember, this is God is the king of his own kingdom. He's a just king. And he will judge all justly according to what they've been given to work with according to each person's several ability. How many are thankful that you won't be judged uh, with the same judgment as, say, Billy Graham? How many are thankful that God will judge you according to your ability? How many are thankful for that? How many are thankful you're not going to be judged by Christians? Good grief, I wouldn't stand a chance. Uh, of whom much is given, Jesus said, much is demanded. This is an interesting thought because I never looked at it like this. 
of whom much is given, much is demanded. How many understand there's a flip side of that coin? Of whom little is given, little is demanded. He doesn't judge all the same. So again, Matthew 22, Jesus says that there are many are called. The word called means many are invited or appointed to be saints. How many know you're a saint of God? You don't even have a statue. St. George, can you imagine the statue? With that mustache. <laughs> many are called, they're appointed to be saints. In fact, Paul wrote this very thing. Look at Romans 1 and 7. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be what? Saints. Grace to you, peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. So the call of the called... Remember, he said, many are called, few are chosen. The call of the called is to be a saint. The Greek word for saint is hagios. It's to be set apart by and for God. Set apart. Who does the setting apart? God. No one else. Is that true? God alone. Set apart from who? Did you ever ask that? If there are people that are set apart, I have group A and group B. They've been set apart from each other. Isn't that true? I mean, it's not like it's all combined and they're all just set apart into massive group. They are set apart. God set them apart personally from who? The world. You've got to stay with me because I'm building this, you know. This is like I'm a lawyer building a case. This apart setting is instigated by God, and it's not by our own choice. How many know you didn't choose to know God? You think you did. But then he humbles you, and you realize all your decisions are bad. Your first choice in all of this is to accept or reject an invitation. Isn't that true? But it was God who initiated original contact. Is that true? God came to you. He initiated contact. He put it in your heart, the desire to know him, the desire to need him. But here's what you need to know. Not all receive an invitation. This is where the confusion begins, and it's because we don't understand the way of a kingdom. We understand the way of a religion. We all understand Christianity. We understand religion. But we don't understand a kingdom. Let's look deeper. Remember in Matthew 25, where Jesus calls his own servants, and he delivered unto them his goods. He refers to the goods as talents, which are measured out, and the talents are actually measured out disproportionately, aren't they? One gets five, one gets two, one gets one. How many know that's not the same? How many learned in math that the numbers five, two, and one are not the same numbers? Just, I'm just trying to keep you with me. One got five, one got two, one got one. And he called them talents. Talenton, it's a Greek word, and it means a measured amount. God gave each one specifically a measured amount. Of what? How many know he doesn't say? How many know he doesn't say? He just said he gave them talents, a measured amount. But he never says of what, does he? Just calls it a measured amount. Jesus taught everything with dark sayings and in mysteries. But Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, and Peter also tells us what is measured out. Look at 1 Peter 4 and 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of what? The manifold grace of God. He calls his servants, his stewards, 
And he called us to be stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter tells us, Paul said the same thing. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. But it's a gift. And then Peter talks about the gift. And he calls it the manifold grace of God. The manifold grace of God is given in measured amounts according to the servants, each one of us, according to our ability. It's just like being on a team. How many understand that? Just like being on a team. How many were ever on a team that you were the best player on the team? Nobody. I've been there. But that's because everybody else was terrible. <laughs> and my dad was the coach. <laughs> so I played for the team that got all the, everybody else got all the kids, the Roaring Spring teams, all the other teams, picked all the good kids, and then we got what was left over. Kids with no gl ball glove, kids with no shoes, you know. Kids that were always standing looking away from the ball field, laying in the outfield. You know, that's the kind we got. It's exactly the same. It's according to several ability. We got all the, we got these people with, with how many were ever the worst person on a team? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit that. No, my wife did. <laughs> She's just counting her and I being a team. <laughs> <laughs> Measured amounts, but it's according to that servant's several ability. According to the servant's several ability, they are given the be a steward of the manifold grace of God. The word manifold is poikilos. It's various in character or individual in nature. God's influence on man is diverse. How many ever met somebody and you say, wow, they're not much of a Christian? You know why? Because God's influence is diverse on everyone. Compared to the way you look. That would be like me saying I'm a great ball player until I went out on the field with the Pittsburgh Pirates. And they'd go, oh, we got the worst one. This must be Paul Gokenauer's son. <laughs> we heard about him. Right? Right? You're all great. It's like being a big fish in a little pond, right? <laughs> God's influence on every person is diverse. It's different in variety and nature. God's, we look at somebody else and we say, wow, they don't have in Christians' eyes, it's easy to judge, isn't it? How many know that God doesn't want us to judge? I heard four different messages this week. One was from my wife, one was from her friend, and two were uh, on YouTube. And all four of them were preaching about how Jesus said, watch your mouth in this last day. If you want to serve me in purity, shut your mouth. He said, every idle word that you'll speak, you'll give an account. Jesus told this guy, his name was Kevin something. I can't remember. He had gone to heaven. And God told him specifically, remember I told you that every idle word you speak, you're going to give an account of it. He said, yes. He said, I meant that. Watch what you say. Speak things that only come from the Spirit. Don't speak what comes from your soul. Speak what only comes from you. So if you see somebody that doesn't have as much uh, of, of the manifold grace of God on their life, bless God, they know God. How many understand that? Thank the Lord they know the Lord. Be thankful they're on your team. Be thankful they're filling the position. Don't be arrogant. Don't be proud about it. The more I grow in pride, you know what I grow in? Religion. The more I grow in pride, the more I grow in religion. I need to continually just be thankful for them for where they are. I'm looking at that little, my little grandbaby down there, and she's just now pulling herself up and starting to stand up. You know, the other ones are running like mad. I'm not judging her because she can just stand up. I mean, come on, kid. You're a year old this week. Get it together. <laughs> right? Everybody is where they are. It's the manifold grace of God. It's individually given. If God gave you the grace to hear his voice, be humble. Thank him for that. Because not everyone is given the same thing. Some are given five. Some are given two. Some are given one. Some people are given much grace, while others are given very little to work with. Be thankful for what you have. 
If you have a great awareness of God, be continually thankful and remember, it wasn't your choice. It was God's grace given by God's own choice of selection. God selected you to have that. Just be thankful. Nothing else. Just be thankful. Let me ask you this. How many believe God gave medical researchers and doctors their ability to discover the way to help and bring human bodies back to health? How many believe that? Me too. Amen. How many are thankful for that? Me too. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I know I've asked this question before, but how many are thankful for the fact that you didn't have to walk or ride a horse to church? I passed some people that were riding bikes and horses, and I was thankful that I wasn't. I went around them quick enough to blow their hair up. <laughs> How many are thankful that you don't have to go home and build a fire to cook your dinner by? Or that you don't have to cook it with a candle light besides so you can see whether it's burn or not? Or maybe you want to put the candle out so you don't have to see. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. How many feel lost and helpless when the power goes out for an hour? How many just get this feeling of dread like the world just ended? Good grief what happened, right? It's the apocalypse. I know it is. Every time the power goes out, it's the apocalypse. How many are thankful that God gave his grace to the men who invented medication and vehicles and electricity? All the things that we take for granted until it goes off or runs in short supply, right? Do you understand the brilliance of these inventors is divine influence. How many understand that it came from God? It's divine influence. There's natural realm divine influence and we're thankful for that. If it was your personal responsibility to be in charge of human transportation, how many understand that we would still be walking? If we took this whole group and we said, you're in charge from now on of human transportation, and there was nothing but walking, how many know at the end of our lives we'd probably still be walking? Why? Because you weren't given the grace to invent a bicycle, let alone the internal combustion engine. You understand that, right? For thousands and thousands of years, there weren't even a bicycle. So here's what we must understand. There is grace given to the natural realm and to the spirit realm. Divine influence is given to the kingdoms of this world as well as to the kingdom of God. How many believe that? Sadly, I personally believe that the world has done more with their grace than the church has done with theirs. I believe the church is still in the horse and buggy stage of her spiritual development. Just my opinion. I believe the world is continually accelerating when it comes to technology while the church has stagnated in growth and development of spiritual understanding. Again, remember the five talents, two talents, and one talent scenario in Matthew chapter 25. Let's look again at verses 24 and 25. Then he which had received the one talent came and he said, Lord, I knew that you're a hard man and you reap where you didn't sow and you gather where you didn't straw. And I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the earth and look, you have what is yours. What if the unprofitable servant of grace isn't merely some poor hapless Christian, but is instead an entire generation of non-advancing believers? How many understand that in the Old Testament there are times in the Psalms it talks about it and then in Hebrews it talks about it where it says, and God was angry with that generation. See, that terrifies me. And God was angry because you know who the generation was? How many understand that Moses was in that generation? And Joshua and Caleb. And there were a lot of priests that were wonderful, beautiful men of God and Levites and just godly men. And that, but because the generation itself, the majority of the generation created this generation that God was just unhappy with. Said and God was unhappy with the entire generation. That terrifies me for our generation. I don't want to be part of that generation. I want to be part of a generation that pleases God. 
an entire church generation who because of their great fear of deception or failure refuses to take the seed of grace that they were given and to use it to advance the kingdom of God and the understanding of it. Because we're afraid that we might be deceived. You know, I probably, if I listen to the radio and listen to preachers, I probably hear more sermons on deception and remaining free of deception than just about anything that's preached in the church. There's going to be deception. There's going to be deception. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. I understand that. But you know what happens? It creates a fear in the people, and then they don't advance. It's like saying you can't go west because there's wild animals and Indians. And so everybody goes, let's just pile up on the east coast. But there were brave people that said, I'm going to go anyway, regardless. I know there's a danger. I accept the danger. I'm willing to sacrifice. God's looking for people who are willing to sacrifice. I look at the church and I see men and women with great grace who have used divine influence that they were entrusted with to build their own empires using the name of Jesus instead of advancing the kingdom. Ezekiel 14. The, the, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out my hand upon it and I'll break the staff of the bread thereof and I will send famine upon it, and I'll cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, look what he says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by, the right, by their righteousness, says the Lord God. This is a terrifying thought, isn't it? God's saying about the entire nation, he said, even if there was these three men were involved, just like Moses and Joshua and Caleb, he said, if there was just those three, by their own righteousness, they'll be delivered. But the rest of them will be judged. God mentions three spiritual warriors who grew in grace. Noah, Daniel, and Job. Three spiritual warriors who grew in grace despite the tremendous persecution that they were forced to endure. I believe that these three are examples of men who were given great grace and were able to invest it and double it for the master. Regardless of what was going on around them, they were able to invest. They were good servants, able to invest and double their investment for the master. These men stood alone and bravely advanced the kingdom of God in their generation. So when Daniel was young, I'm looking at Daniel. When Daniel was young, he was taken uh, as a slave into a violent heathen nation. We think, about, we think about our nation and the way it's becoming. How many know it's nothing compared to the nation Daniel was taken to? Daniel was taken as a very young, as a teenage young man, as a slave. I would imagine the things he saw and experienced were violent and traumatizing. He was castrated as a teenager. And he was made into a eunuch and forced to serve an idol-worshiping king. How many know that if your children were taken from you, if you had a young son and he was castrated by the government and made to serve the government, how many know that you wouldn't stand for it? How many know Daniel didn't have a choice? And not only was he made to serve the government, he's made to serve a wicked government, an idol-worshiping government who would put men to death for not serving their idols. Daniel's life is unchangeably and irreversibly altered, and he experiences a complete loss of freedom and security. How many know there's nothing he can do to undo what they did to him? How many would kind of be bitter about this? It would be hard not to be, wouldn't it? We live in such a whiny generation, don't we? whiny about everything, like every little thing we might whiny about. Daniel endured this. He endured it. We used to sing a song, Dare to be a Daniel, Dare to stand alone. Dare to find a purpose firm, Dare to make it known. When I was in Bible school. How many would pout and whine and complain about the unfair life that God gave you if you were Daniel? 
But Daniel was given a unique grace, wasn't he? He was able to interpret the dreams of the heathen and then warn them of impending danger. If you were able to interpret the dreams of the heathen who had destroyed your life, would you warn them of impending danger? How many would have a hard time warning the, your captain of impending danger? Daniel's ministry in Babylon is literally a type of the call of the church to the world. I want you to see this. Daniel is in Babylon, isn't he? But he's not of Babylon. He is so valuable to the government and as, a, as an advisor, possessed of such great wisdom that he literally earns the favor of everyone in authority. The only ones that hated him were the ones that were beside him. But the ones that were over him always loved him. So as Daniel gets older, there's a king in Babylon whose name is Belshazzar. How many remember that king? Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the mighty Nebuchadnezzar. It's his grandson. Nebuchadnezzar was who Daniel was taken captive by. And Daniel gave Nebuchadnezzar amazing wisdom. But now the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, many years later, is in office. And Belshazzar represents something. How many know the Old Testament shows a lot of representation of things that are prophetic, and we've got to look at that. Belshazzar represents an entitled generation ruling over the natural realm. Belshazzar did nothing to earn the position that he's in. He's a representative of an entitled generation who's ruling in the natural realm. Remember, God gave the kingdoms of this world to natural realm kingdoms of this world. We studied that two weeks ago. God gave the kingdoms of this world, every person that's in authority is put there by who? God. So he gave the kingdoms of this world to the natural realm uh, kings. In order to understand divine arrangement, you must see the heart of God and his will toward natural humanity. Look at Daniel chapter 5. Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, whilst he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar, it's actually his grandfather, the King James says father, but it's not, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought in the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. And they drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. In the same hour there came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him. How many would be a little troubled if you saw a hand writing on the wall? In fact, the Bible says the joints of his loins were loosened. That is literally one of my favorite parts of scripture. Can you imagine his legs knocking together? And his knees smote one against another. Looked like a cartoon. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spoke and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever shall read the writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then came in all the wise men. But they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. So here we have King Belshazzar, who's riding the coattails of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. It looks a lot like what we have today. An entitled, privileged generation that got there on the coattails of someone else. You understand that, right? This generation benefited from the hard work of another. And now, all they want to do is party. Much like today. Daniel and his God were highly honored all the days of Nebuchadnezzar. 
In fact, listen to Nebuchadnezzar's final recorded words in Daniel chapter 4. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, what are you doing? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought unto me. I was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth, his ways are judgment, or justice is the word, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. These are the very final words ever recorded of King Nebuchadnezzar. Kingdom of God believers. How many consider yourself a kingdom of God believer? The call of kingdom of God believers is to make such a great impact on the world's people that they see God's power and they honor him as God. That's our call. Not on other Christians. On the world. Remember, God separates his people from who? The world. He separates us from the world. But we have a responsibility to God to return the favor. He gives us this manifold grace to work with. His divine influence. He gives us divine influence to work with. In order to influence the world. That the, I have something to share with you maybe next week. Hopefully I can. That it's just mind blowing. It's just amazing. I am so thankful. Now here's what's amazing, and here's what's hard for Christians to understand. Historians agree that there's no evidence that King Nebuchadnezzar ceased to be a worshiper of his gods, Belmarduk, Nebo, and Nergal. From the time he knew this god, he continued to worship his own gods. How many think that's kind of bizarre? It's so (laughs) non-Christian. Right? But there's a reason. And we're going to, over the next several weeks, we're going to discuss it. But, even though he continued to worship his own gods, he now recognized that Jehovah is to be worshipped as the Almighty God. So because of the grace on Daniel's life, the greatest world-conquering leader of the natural realm at that time bows his knee to a God that he never really knows, but he honors. Because of the influence of Daniel, this non-believing king honors the God of heaven. We need to understand that this eternal way of God never changes. This is the divine arrangement of God. Nebuchadnezzar saw the power of God, didn't he? And he recognized that it was God's power because of Daniel. And the Bible says that he repented. How many understand that these last several verses I read to you are somebody having a change in the way they think? How many know that's what repentance is? This is his repentance. This is this idol-worshiping king's repentance. Remember, he might have died with a prayer to one of his own gods on his lips. But the Bible says he honored this God, Jehovah, as the greatest God 
as the highest God. And the Bible talks about this many times, and we're going to discuss all that. Remember, don't be uncomfortable. I'm teaching you something that God's been showing me for the last several years, and I'm just now putting it together. So he repented. Nebuchadnezzar repented. His way of thinking changed. How many can see that again? How many sees that he repented? Did he become a Jew? How many know those were the only chosen people at that time? They were God's chosen people, still are. How, how many know Nebuchadnezzar didn't become a Jew? What did he become? An honorable worshiper of God. Look what Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Remember, after the God-honoring Nebuchadnezzar generation, remember, Nebuchadnezzar was a God-honor, wasn't he? In the end of his life, there's no denying. He said, now I praise and I extol and I honor the God of heaven. After the God-honoring Nebuchadnezzar generation came the filthy, entitled, God-dishonoring generation of Belshazzar. These patterns never change. They literally never change. A generation who is so bored with nothing constructive to do, so they fill their time with alcohol, sexual perversion, and thumbing their noses in the face of Almighty God. We will drink out of your holy chalice and we will worship our gods while we do it. Remember Belshazzar? Peter says here, that the way of the last day's inhabitants of the earth will be a lifestyle that will scoff at God. Their lifestyle becomes the lifestyle of Belshazzar. They're, remember, riding the coats. How many know even our generation is riding the coats of tales of past generations? How many understand that that's absolutely true? How many disgusts you? Does me too. This bored generation has nothing constructive to do, so they fill their lives with partying and alcohol and sexual perversion and mocking God. Peter says here that that'll be the same as the way of the last day inhabitants of the earth. It will be a lifestyle that mocks God. A lifestyle that mocks God. To scoff is to dishonor and to show great disrespect. It's an expression of mocking, contempt, and derision. Then look what Peter says, in, starting in verse 5. For this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, don't be ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord isn't slack concerning his promise, as some men would count slackness, but his long suffering to us. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many believe that's true? Notice what Peter doesn't say. I always do this. I want to look, not what he said, but I also want to see what he didn't say. So notice what Peter doesn't say. He doesn't say that it's God's will that all would become kingdom of God seekers. Otherwise, he's just separated everybody unto himself. So what's the use of separation? If he just separated everybody unto himself. But he didn't, did he? The called and the chosen. Those who are separated unto God. He declares here that God is calling. This is literally what he's talking about. God is waiting because he's calling the nations to repent. How many can get on board with that? God is calling the nations to repent. 
Amen. To have a change of heart and to begin to honor the God of heaven. Remember, repentance is John the Baptist's baptism, which is inferior to Jesus' baptism. John said, I indeed baptize with water under repentance, but there's one mightier than I coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. You know what he said? John's baptism is the highest call of the natural realm. When we think of repentance, we're indoctrinated to immediately think become a Christian. How many have ever read the word, you need to repent, you think you need to become a Christian? Everybody! Your arms aren't working, but it's true. Right? Everybody, he repented. When we think of repentance, we think become a Christian. Become a Christian. Because that's what we've been indoctrinated to believe. But it's not the will of God. It wasn't from the beginning the will of God for believers to become Christians. I love stuff like this. Look at Mark 3. If a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. How many agree with this? How many thought Abraham Lincoln said this? And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. The kingdom of God is indivisible. How many believe that? It's not like the United States. Indivisible. The kingdom of God. How many believe the kingdom of God? Do me a favor. Let me see your hand if you believe the kingdom of God is indivisible. Amen? The kingdom of God is indivisible on earth as it is in heaven. How many think it's divided in heaven? How many think God says, okay, well, today we're going to do this, and the angels go, I don't think I want to do that. How many know there's none of that? They all go, yes, sir. Absolutely. Whatever you say, stand on our heads. That's fine. We will. Right? He's God. The kingdom of God is in, indivisible. It means it's unable to be divided. The kingdom is of God is one body in one accord. Is that true? Absolutely. Anytime Satan can push a move of God into a religion, it can at that point be divided. If Satan can push a move of God into a religion, he knows he can divide it. Is that true? How many have ever known a religion that wasn't divided? Christianity is a completely divided religion. You say, I don't believe that, Dan. Well, we're divided. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's filled with natural realm men and women who have repented and now attempt to live their lives to honor God, much like Nebuchadnezzar. The vast majority of Christians are not spiritual. They're not kingdom of God seekers. In fact, most are there because they're seeking to stay out of hell when they die. Just true. Multitudes are servants of their conscience through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but they're not spiritual. Why? Because they've not been called or chosen. We mock them, but God has them there. They honor God, let them alone. If they're there honoring God, let them alone. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. John said, we saw one casting out demons, but they weren't using your name, so we told them to stop. Jesus said, why would you tell them that? They're using what the little grace they've been given. Let them alone. I'm going to hurry. I said this was going to be short. Remember Jesus' conversation uh, with the Pharisee Nicodemus. Look at John 3, starting verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. That same came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God is with him. We read that last week. How many want God to be with us? How many want the power of God? He said the only way God can, that we can do miracles is if God's with us. Jesus answered and he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and 
of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So again, Jesus is talking to a Pharisee with the mentality of a Jewish Pharisee. The teachings of the Jewish rabbis is that proselytism was regarded as a new birth. If they can get you to come to church, if they can get you to believe like they do, this is what the Jewish rabbis believe, that was considered a new birth. How many know Jesus knew who he was talking to? You're born of water. We understand that. The new birth was brought about by being circumcised and baptized. And that was seen by the Jews as repentance. So Jesus tells Nicodemus that there's a birth that's beyond the birth, the new birth of repentance. Yes, you were born with a new birth, and that birth was the birth of repentance. In order to understand what Jesus was saying, you would have to realize who he was talking to. He was basically saying, a man must be born again, and then again. That's why he was saying to Nicodemus, yes, you've been born again, but you need to be born again again. There's something beyond repentance. There's something more. There's a power of God that's missing from you. They said, you have power. There's a power of God. Why isn't the power of God in the church? Because the church needs to be born again, again. And we live in that generation that needs to be born again, again. He must be born again of the Spirit. But the religion of Christianity has confused this whole process to the point where it's not even understandable anymore. I've listened to preachers preach after 45 years. I still don't get most of it. They use Christian talk, and I'm like, I question their Christian. It's stuff that we hear. How many know just because something sounds familiar doesn't mean you understand it? They can say it over and over, and I go, I still don't get it. I want understanding. So we need to look deeper. Listen, how many are thankful that you've received the baptism of repentance? How many are thankful that, that Jesus came and he... He led you into the place of repentance. How many are just, bless the Lord, right? I honor God with my life. There's a place in eternity for those who honor God. Do you know in the Old Testament, the Jews taught, I wasn't going to tell you this. I was telling it to my dad and mom the other day. The Jews taught the Noahite law. How many have ever heard of that, the Noahite law? It was actually a law that was passed from Adam to Noah. And it had to do with the Gentiles. It had to do with those outside of those who were chosen or selected by God. Before there was a nation, there were just men chosen and selected by God. And the Noahite law had to do with all the men of the world, the millions of men in the world. And that Noahite law gave certain uh, uh, laws to these men to follow, rules to follow. And if they followed these rules, this was given from, to Adam and it was passed to Noah. And the Jews taught this all through the Old Testament. How many know there's a lot of stuff we don't know? This was taught all through the Old Testament that if the Gentiles lived according to these certain laws, don't murder, don't be sexually perversion, don't be involved in sexual perversion. There was just a few. There was like four or five that they would have a place in eternity given to them by God. You say, well, that can't be. That's not Christian. Nope, it's not. But guess what? Neither is God. God's not a Christian either. How many are thankful that you've fulfilled that? You've come into that place where you honor God and you bless his name. And you honor him enough to live your life. There's times you mess up. How many know there, that there are people here that have messed up before? Not, not all of us, but there are some. You're all looking at me like I'm the one. <laughs> but we mess up, but how many know that God cleanses and he forgives? I spend more time begging God to just cleanse me so that I can remain in his presence. I want to be in his presence. How many want more? How many, how many want more than just repentance? How many want more than just the ability to offer God a life that I, I just dodged every bullet that was thrown at me? 
but I was actually able to bring you uh, 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 more than you gave me to begin with. I was actually able to turn a profit for you. How many want that? We want more in this life. How many want to rule and reign with Jesus? Amen? We're going to continue to pursue this, this teaching because... This teaching is literally one of the biggest things I've ever been given, and I'm thankful for it. And it terrifies me to teach it. Every time I look at this, I think, Lord, they're just going to run me out on a rail when I'm done with this. Every time. They're going to hate me when I'm done, and they're not going to come back. They're going to say, forget Dan, let's nail the door shut so he can't get back in. <laughs> but I'm teaching something that the Spirit of God keeps telling me, keeps working. I tell my wife all the time about it, too, and we talk about this constantly. He wants this message in the church in the last day. He wants a kingdom message in the church. Thank God for the message of repentance. I've lived under that message for 40 years. But now I'm living under the message of the kingdom. I want to know my place in the kingdom. And I want every person here to know your place in the kingdom of God. Amen? Stand with me if you would.